there in Numbers 13. And if you would stand with me in honor of God as we read his word together. And we're going to begin in verse 25. These, these 12 spies have been sent out by Moses to inspect the land that God has called them to. And then we come to verse 25 and we read this. It says, At the end of 40 days they returned from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, We came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. Besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. And then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we, are, we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. And you come into verse 1 of chapter 14. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry. And the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, Let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. You may be seated. May God encourage us through his word this morning. And Father, we do ask your blessing on us. We ask that you would be, be kind to us, help us to think about these, these truths and to assess our lives and walk in joyful obedience to you and experience the, the blessing of, of a right relationship with you. We pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. The story that we're looking at this morning in Numbers 13 and 14 is the most pivotal story in the book of Numbers. And really, as you think about the overarching story of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, this, this story could be said to be the, the most, one of the most pivotal events in the Pentateuch in, in terms of the narrative structure. I mean, think about what's, what's taken place. You have the beginning of creation, at the beginning of, of the Pentateuch, and then you have the fall. You have God through Abraham promising deliverance and, and a kingdom and a, and a king and this, this land that, that this kingdom is going to exist in. And then you have the stories of the patriarchs, and you have the patriarchs arriving in Egypt at the end of the book of Genesis. And then as you come into the book of Exodus, you have the people being taken out of Egypt, taken out of slavery, and prepared to be a people in this, this promised land, a land in which God's rest that was lost through sin, God's rest and joy in relationship can be experienced again. And then when they're on the, the cusp of entering into the promised land, here in Numbers 13 and 14, they send 12 spies into the land and they ultimately fall short. This, this story is, is pivotal for us understanding what takes place in the Pentateuch and what the people who are reading the Pentateuch are, are supposed to, to think and how they're supposed to respond to this, this story. Surprisingly then, surprisingly then, some people sometimes get this story wrong. Sometimes I've heard people talk about this story and say, so the, the, the message here is we need to dream big and, and believe in ourselves. We need to kind of uh, think big thoughts and, and be adventuresome and, and not be afraid. And maybe there's some good ideas there, but, but that's not 
what the, the point of this passage is. A few months ago, I was uh, going into the kitchen and I saw my oldest daughter, Hannah, there in the kitchen and, and she was a little stressed out. She kind of had a bunch of books laid out and she was kind of looking at them and she was kind of writing some notes and I said, what's wrong, Hannah? And she said, oh, dad, I just, I have so much to do. I don't know how I'm going to get this, all this done. And you know, you know how someone kind of can, can feel overwhelmed by life and circumstances. That's where my daughter was at. And I said, Hannah, let me help you here. Hannah, I want you to believe in yourself and reach for the stars. And she started laughing because I've never told her to believe in herself and reach for the stars. I said, no, wait, wait, hey, no, hold on. Let me help you some more. I want you to reach beyond the stars. And we laughed again because the statement's pretty ridiculous, right? It, it doesn't help you at all to, to kind of think vague, happy thoughts about things and to believe in yourself. And in fact, she kind of had the last laugh. A few weeks later, she had, been, she had been working on her schedule again, and she had kind of posted her schedule in a room. And when I came in, I, I saw this picture. It was a picture of her schedule, and it was on this board that said, Reach Beyond the Stars, uh, which I was like, that's some good parenting right there. Um, when my daughter reaches beyond the stars someday, it's going to be because I told her to. You know? No, I mean, that doesn't really help a person, right? That, that vague belief. Let, let, me, let me remind you where we are in the book of Numbers and kind of an outline of the book of Numbers. Here, here's a map that you can kind of see where things are taking place in the book of Numbers. And if you want to think of an outline of this book, you can kind of think geographically. The story begins kind of far there in the south around Mount Sinai, kind of at the bottom of the screen there. You, you see Mount Sinai, and that's where the first 10 chapters nine chapters and 10 verses take place in the book of Numbers. And then, that's the first, that's the first part of the book of Numbers. And then there's travel. They travel from Mount Sinai up to Kadesh Barnea. And you kind of see a little red line there that goes up to Kadesh Barnea. And so that that second section of the book of Numbers, chapter 12, 11, the, those part of chapter 10, that's kind of a, a, the second section, it's, it's travel. So first section at Mount Sinai, second section is travel, and then this morning we're in the third section of the book of Numbers, which is the people of Israel around Kadesh Barnea. And this third section is going to take place over 40 years. The fourth section is travel again, and then the fifth section is the people encamped on the plains of Moab. So those are kind of the, the five sections of the book of Numbers. This morning, we're at Kadesh Barnea. And as we're here at Kadesh Barnea, the message that we see, again, it's not some vague belief in yourself, reach for the stars. That's not what is being communicated in these two chapters. Here's the central idea that I want you to grasp. What we're going to see is that obedience or excuse me, belief produces obedience, which leads to joy. In fact, here's kind of a little chart here. So belief produces obedience and leads to joy. And as we go through these two chapters, what you're going to see is this kind of formula play itself out. Belief produces obedience, which leads to joy. And conversely, unbelief, produces disobedience, which leads to sorrow, to, to death, to wrath. And, and so how does that apply to you and to me? Well, as we've talked about before, you and I are the people in the book of Numbers. Remember as we see the New Testament writers talk about this passage, they say, we like the people in the book of Numbers have been rescued from bondage and we are not yet in the place of God's rest. We're in this in-between time. And so the message to us is the same as it is to the people here in the Pentateuch. But what, what you and I need to think about is this. When I encounter disobedience in my life, I need to ask myself, why is this here? 
sometimes our temptation can be to do this. We encounter disobedience and we say, yeah, this, this disobedience is here, but, but I'm pretty sure things are okay with me and God, and, and so I'm expecting to experience joy. And what this passage tells us is, tells us is this. Look, if you encounter disobedience in your life, you need to ask yourself, why is this disobedience here? And sometimes the answer to that question can become very uncomfortable. So a person encounters disobedience, they say, okay, I, I, I see in Scripture how I'm supposed to treat my parents. I see the relationship that I'm supposed to have with friends at school. I see how I'm supposed to respond to authority. I see what I'm supposed to do in terms of media that I consume and participate in. And, and I, I see that I'm supposed to do that and I'm doing something different. I, I'm supposed to treat my wife in a certain way and I'm treating her in a way that's, that's not how God would have me treat her or think about her or, or whatever it is. I, I see how God says I'm supposed to handle my finances or view the world. I'm not doing that. So I, I'm encountering this disobedience and we ask ourselves, why is this here and do I want it to be here? And we can't just say, yeah, it's here, but that's just kind of one of those things. We say, okay, this disobedience is here. What does that say about my relationship with God? Does it mean that this is just kind of an aberration and I, I don't want it to be here, I'm going to ask God to deal with it? Or do I say, no, this disobedience is kind of at the core of who I am. And this disobedience is here because I don't really believe God. I don't believe what he says about his power. I don't believe what he says about how to live in obedience. I don't believe what he says about how joy is found. I don't believe that he is a great treasure. And if... If I come to that realization that, that I don't believe God, then I've answered the question why the disobedience is there, and I need to be careful because where does that path lead? It leads to sorrow. It leads to God's wrath. It leads to judgment. If I want to experience joy, there needs to be obedience. And that obedience isn't something I just manufacture by reaching for the stars and believing in myself. No, the belief is very specific. It's a belief in God, a trust in him. And that belief in God, specifically in his son Jesus, in his salvific work, my belief in Jesus does what? It produces obedience and it leads to joy. In other words, if I find myself in a place of sustained disobedience, I cannot deceive myself and think that joy is in my future. I'm on a much different path. Belief leads to obedience, which leads to joy. Let's walk through this story together and, and see how this plays out in the book of Numbers, chapters 13 and 14. It begins with this. It begins with the sending of the spies in verses 1 through 20. And we see in the book of Deuteronomy that this, this whole scenario gets set up as the people come to Moses and say, hey, we want to kind of look at the land that we're going into. The, the people are encamped kind of on the south of the promised land. They say, hey, can we send some spies? And, and God here in Numbers 13 says, yeah, that's fine. And everyone kind of gathers together. And Moses says, okay, here are the here are the 12 guys who are going to go. Each of them represents one of the 12 tribes. Joshua comes from the tribe of Judah. Ca I'm sorry, Caleb comes from the, from the tribe of Judah. Joshua comes from the tribe of Ephraim. And those are the guys who are selected. And then, and as we come into verse 21 of Numbers 13, we see the work of the spies. They, in fact, here's kind of a little uh, picture of where they go. They're sent into the region, and they start there in the south at Kadesh Barnea and kind of travel in this, this northwestern direction west of the Jordan River. And they kind of travel, they look at the land, and their mission has been to go, to spy out the land, to look at the cities, to look at the, the people, to look at the land and see, okay, what's good, what's bad, what's big, what's small. And so they do it. They, they make this journey in 40 days. It's a trip of some 500 miles. And as they are traveling, Mo, Moses had told them, hey, as long as you're there, grab some fruit. They grab some fruit. It's, it's huge. It takes 
two of them to carry this cluster of grapes, and they begin to make their way back to Moses and the people. A good writer, as he tells a story, creates tension. You know, you know tension is that, that feeling of, of unease when you are watching a movie or listening to a story. When our kids were little, it was much more fun to watch them watch a movie than to watch the movie itself. You know, like our son Noah would just, I mean, he would stand up and he would just kind of be walking along with the characters, you know, and just kind of bobbing up and down. Um, our, our daughter Hannah one time came to me and said, Daddy, I don't think I can watch cartoons anymore. Nothing ever goes right, you know. And so she, just that kind of, that, that stressful feeling. A few months ago, our children wanted to watch that movie, um, Finding Dory, and I had to walk out of the room. I said, this is driving me crazy. Why those fish can't just find each other? It reminds me of this other movie that drove me crazy called Finding Nemo. Same thing, just, just really tense, right? That, that sense of tension is, okay, how, is this, how is this story going to resolve? What's going to happen? How are things going to work out? As the story begins here, the, the first part of the, the tension is, okay, how's the land going to be? God has said this is going to be a, land, a good land, but remember this, the people who are, who are traveling to the promised land have never been there. Moses, as he gives instructions to the guys, like, uh, they're kind of vague, like, hey, just kind of go into this region. I, I don't know what you're going to find there. I've, I've never been there. None of the people have actually been there. And so the tension is, okay, we've left Egypt and we've traveled to this place. It's been a hard trip. Is this going to really be a, a good place? And that tension is, is beginning to be answered. I mean, just ask the two guys who are carrying this big cluster of grapes. I mean, this, this is a, a land with, with good things in it. Next section we come to describes the report of the spies. The report of the spies. They gather everyone together, right? There's Moses, there's Aaron, they're there at Kadesh Barnea, they're at the south of the promised land. They come back, there's Moses, there's Aaron, there's the 12 spies, and they bring in some of the other leaders, so kind of representatives of the whole congregation of Israel. And everyone is there to listen to what the spies are going to say. And so here's another part of the tension building. What are these spies going to say? What do they see? What is the land like? And they, they show them the fruit, and then they give this report and it's kind of a, a good news, bad news report. The, the land's good. The land itself. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. This is a, a land that is going to produce good things. It has this fruit, and here, and here you go. Here's the fruit you asked for, Moses. That, that's, that's the good news. Now, here's the bad news. You asked about the people. They're big. You asked about the cities. They're big and they're well defended. And not only are there lots of people and, and lots of cities, I mean, they're everywhere. Every direction you go, there are people. You want to go to the mountains? There's people. You want to go to the, to the, the southern area? There's people. You want to go along the the the, um, the water's edge and go along the, the valley, there's Canaanites. I mean, everywhere you turn, there are people. Okay. The tension builds. The 12 have given this, this report, and it's factually true. Now, what are the spies going to recommend based upon what they've just said? The good news, land is nice. Bad news, Big cities, big people. Caleb speaks first. And he says, well, I think I've heard all I need to hear. Let's go. Let's, let's, let's do this. I mean, his, his report, his, his suggestion is short and sweet, right? He says, let's go up at once. You know, I, I got time. Let's, let's go now. Let's occupy. Let's, let's do this thing. For we are, he says, I like how, how the ESV translates it here. We're we are well able to overcome it. We, we've got this thing. Good land. Let's do it. 
But then the majority give their opinion. Based upon the exact same evidence, what, what do the majority say? They, they directly contradict Caleb. They, they say, we are not able. You say we're well able. We are, say we, are, we are saying we are not able to go against this people. They're stronger than we are. And they brought to the people of Israel what it says here is a bad report or an evil report. The land, they say, the land, this, this land that God has said is good, it's actually a land that eats up its people. It devours them. The people there are great in height. We even saw the Nephilim, these, these huge people. And when we were around them, we were like, man, we're like grasshoppers. And they looked at us and, man, these guys are like grasshoppers. So here's, here's the situation. Imagine the scene. The 12 have given a report. Caleb says, yep, let's, sounds good to me. Let's go. And the 10 say, are, are you crazy? They're essentially saying, look, if you listen to Caleb and you try to, I mean, did you hear what we said? If you listen to Caleb, you're a fool. If you think that going into this land, yeah, nice land, but if you think going into it is going to be a good idea, you are a foolish person. Now, Let's, let's leave that scene for just a moment. And as, as we think about that scene, I hope you can see the cultural parallels that exist for us today. The person who says, yeah, I think I'm going to live my life in obedience to God is also a person who is viewed as a foolish person. I was reading an, an article about uh, giving among evangelicals, and it was someone was, was kind of re referencing that article from a, a different worldview, and they said, you know, basically a person who would give 10% of their income and more to, to a church is just, it's, it's just crazy to live like that, right? I was reading a, an article about the Nashville Statement. It was a statement that was produced recently. Maybe you heard about it. And it basically talked about a God's intention for marriage and for sexuality. And someone was, was talking about that statement. And they said, man, that is a, a, um, a statement that sounds like the death rattle of a, a, a movement that's, that's dying out. In other words, Christians who believe these, these types of things, man, they're, they're dying out. They're dinosaurs. It's, it's not a realistic way to live. The challenge for those who are going to live by obedience is often going to be how impossible obedience looks to those who don't believe God. Belief produces obedience, leads to life. Unbelief makes disobedience seem more plausible, even though it leads to death. Let's go back to the scene. The, the ten have just said, look, if you believe Caleb and God that we have the ability to take this land, you're a fool. Their testimony is a direct contradiction to what God has said, and that's why it's called evil. And now the tension rises even more. How are the people going to respond? So there are the, there are the spies, there's Moses, there's Aaron. What are the people going to say as they, they hear this report? Are they, they've heard the, what they've seen. They've heard what Caleb says. They've heard what these other people say. How are they going to respond? And we see in the next scene the response of the people beginning there in verse 1. They wail. They raise a loud cry. It's the cry of despair. And they weep and they grumble against Moses and against Aaron. And they come to this conclusion because of their hearts of unbelief. They said, you know what? And they've said this before, it would be better for us to have died in Egypt or in the wilderness. Okay, so what is that? That's, 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 that's disobedience. They're, they're not, belie or it's, it's, it's unbelief. They, they don't believe what God has said about the goodness of the land. And now they don't believe even in God's character. Listen to what they say about God. Why is God bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Now, before God has said, okay, my deliverance is to be a, one of the reasons, a mechanism to engage your worship. You're going to think about how I saved you from the Egyptians and it's going to cause worship. The Israelites, as they fail to believe God, look at those acts and, and instead of worshiping him, they 
have this, this response of, of disdain toward him as this, this sense of God has done something wicked to us. And then they, they don't believe God. They believe that God has done this to, to harm their wives and their, their children. They become a, a prey, victims, and they say it would be better to go back to Egypt. And then they come to this conclusion in verse 4 because of their warped, unbelieving hearts. They say, you know what? We should choose a leader. Hang with me, guys. Let's choose a new leader and let's go back to Egypt. In short, there is a complete rejection of what God has called them to do. It's complete disobedience because of unbelief. How do Moses and Aaron, they're, they're here, they're listening to what the people are saying. How do they respond? They fall on their faces in fear. Oh, guys, no, 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 no. We've, we've, we've seen this before. We're right there on the edge. We're about to enter the land and, and, and you're, you're missing it. And Caleb and, and Joshua recognize the, the danger that the people are in. And so what do they do? They say, no, 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 guys, 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 hold on, hold on. Remember the land. This is verse 7 of Numbers 14. The land which we pass through to spy out, it's, it's exceedingly good. And if, if God, if Yahweh delights in us, he will bring us into the, this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. In other words, all that God has said so far has been true. Now if God delights in us, this is going to be true, that we experience his joy. Don't, please, verse 9, don't rebel against Yahweh. Don't rebel against the Lord. Don't fear the people. They're, they're, they're like bread for us. We're going to eat them. Now, how can two people, two groups of people, look at the same circumstances and have such radically different understandings? Because one group of people is looking at it through the eyes of faith, saying, this is what God has said, I'm going to believe it. The other group is saying, I, I refuse to believe it. They tear their clothes. It's like some sort of horrible nightmare that's taking place in front of them. And they're thinking, look, guys, Israelites, at this point, there's still time to repent. And, and that's, why, that's why there's this, this fear on the part of Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and Caleb. And how do the people respond to this plea to them to believe the right things about God? They say, you know what we should do? Let's stone these guys. Let's kill them. Complete, utter unbelief leads to outright rebellion. Not only are we going to disobey God and not enter the land, the people who are telling us to do it, we're going to kill them. They couldn't rebel anymore. And then God shows up. In verses 11 through 38, we see the, the judgment of the people, right? Right? The judgment of the people, the Lord says to Moses, how long will this people despise me? How long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I've done among them? And, and then as we look at his words, we remember again this, this formula that we've seen. Okay, belief is going to lead to obedience. It's going to lead to life. Unbelief is going to lead to disobedience. It leads to, to sorrow. And that's exactly what God says is happening. He says, look, the people despise me and they aren't believing in me. He says, I'm going to strike them and, and make a new nation. And Moses pleads with the Lord on the basis that he's pled with the Lord before. He says, look, two things he draws God's attention to. First of all, if you do this, the Egyptians will hear about it and will affect your glory because the Egyptians won't give glory to your name. Remember, we saw from long ago as we looked at the, the God's beginning of his plan to establish his kingdom through Abraham. Look, this is all about reaching the nations with the glory of your name. Don't do this because it would contradict that purpose, and so I know you won't. And then he also tells God, look, remember this aspect of your character that also brings glory to your, your name. You are a God of, remember that word? It's the word chesed. It means steadfast love. This, this is who you are, God. And so on the basis, not on the basis of this, this people that don't believe you, but on the basis of who you are, a God who works to bring about your glory, don't do this. Don't do this. 
And God, always acting in accordance with his character, says, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm going, I'm going to show mercy here. And yet, at the same time, there's, there's going to be consequences. And what happens? He says the people who are 20 years old, those who are over 20 years old are, are not going to enter in the promised land. They're going to die there in the wilderness, which is, you know, it's what they said they wanted anyway, right? And those who are younger, the people that they said were going to be the people devoured by the land, they're going to be the people who experience the blessing of it. Now, who is this written to originally? It's not written to the people who die in the wilderness. Moses writes these things, compiles these things, I think primarily on the plains of Moab that we come to at the end of the book of Numbers. It's written to the next generation. And so what this story is, is telling the original audience is, okay, look, here you are. What are you going to do? Here's what your forefathers did. Now, now what are you going to do? Now, as we come to the New Testament, the New Testament writer asks us the same thing in, in Hebrews 3. Okay, you, you are the people in Numbers. You're people who have been delivered from the bondage of slavery, and yet you haven't yet entered into God's rest in heaven. You're here in the between time. What are you going to do? Are you going to have a heart of faith that believes God and practices obedience, or are you going to be and experience this as joy, or are you going to be unbelieving, disobedient, and experience sorrow? And there we finally see the ultimate point of tension in the story. The ultimate point of tension in the story is not, is the land going to be good or not good? I mean, we, we know it's going to be good. It's God. The ultimate point of tension in the story isn't what are the spies going to say. The ultimate point of tension isn't what are the, the people going to say. The ultimate point of tension in the story is will the people even enter into the promised land? Will they even get to enter into God's rest? And brothers and sisters, that's the ultimate point of tension for each of us. Am I going to enter into God's rest and experience his joy both now and for eternity? And when I see disobedience in my life, it, sh it should scare me. Not because, I'm, not because I'm trusting in my own works for salvation, but because I say, look, there's, there's this disobedience here. Is it come, what do I not believe God about? Do I not believe him about where joy is found? Do I not believe him about why I should be obedient in this area? What is it that I don't believe and why is it there and God save me from it? Let's do this. Let's leave these people here, there in Kadesh Barnea for now. We're gonna come back to them in a second. Let's leave them there and I wanna give you some, some, the happy part of the story, okay? So we're gonna travel into the future Joshua and Caleb are there at Kadesh Barnea. We, years go by, they went around the wilderness. The other people who are there at that scene, who are over 20, they, they all die. And now we're 45 years in the future and we're in the promised land. And in fact, you can turn your Bibles to Joshua 14. And in Joshua 14, now we're 45 years in the future and, and Joshua and Caleb, they've wandered around the wilderness, they've entered the promised land and now uh, Joshua is approached by Caleb. And these guys were 40 back here in Kadesh Barnea. Now they're 85. Caleb is. Listen to what he says. This is Joshua 14 and verse 6. And Caleb comes to Joshua and says, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God in Kadesh Barnea, concerning you and me. Hello, old chum. Let's, let's, let's go down memory lane here. Remember what, remember what God told Moses? Remember what Moses promised back 45 years ago? 
I was 40 years old, this is verse 7, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in my heart. But my brothers, you know all this, went up with me, they made the heart of the people melt, yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, surely the land which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. In other words, Joshua, remember that moment? Remember that moment where we came back and we stood before the people and we said, let's go. Let's, and I said, I said, yep, good land, big people, let's go. Remember what happened on that day. Moses promised me that land that you just came back from, someday it will be yours. Now Caleb says Joshua to Joshua, I'm here to collect I believed that promise. I believed it then. I believe it now. Verse 10, God has kept me alive. Just as he said, these 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel walked in the wilderness, I'm 85 years old today. I am still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going and coming. So give me the hill country. Let's do this thing. You know what that is? That's faith. This guy who's 85 years old wants to be obedient because he still believes God. The same land, it's, it's the same land, the same people are there. 45 years ago, the young guys looked at us and said, man, we can't do this. It's been 45 years. Now this 85-year-old man says, man, I'm, I'm still just as capable today to do it as I was 45 years ago. Why? Because God's going to do this thing. Let's go. <laughs> I'm ready. Man, I love Caleb. And he does it. What is that? It's belief. You see, belief is not some just momentary ascent to the truth. You know, I, I kind of believe that. Belief, true belief, is this, this sustained commitment to, to trusting in the Lord. In other words, I can't look at my life and say, you know what, I, I believe God one time. It didn't work out. I guess I shouldn't believe anymore. Belief says, you know what, I believed it today. I'm going to believe it tomorrow. Next week, you know what I'm going to do? Believe it. Ten years from now, I'm still going to believe God. 45 years from now, I'm still going to believe what God says about these issues, and I'm still going to trust him and be obedient. Why? Because I believe. Joshua 15 describes how Caleb does it. There's this great scene where he says, look, whoever goes up to Axa, I'm going to give them and, and conquers it. I'm sorry, whoever, um, Axis is, is his daughter. Whoever goes up to Kiriath Sefer and captures it, I'm going to give him my daughter, which is not a bad way to get your daughter married off too, you know. That's going to be 45 years away. For now, we're back on the scene. Everyone 20 years and old uh, and, uh, and upwards dies. And then we see the last thing. We see the folly of the people in verses 39 through 45. They, they fail to believe God still. Now I say, you know what? You were right. We were wrong. Now let's go. Now let's go conquer the land. And Moses says, no, 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 no. That, that time's over. I've just told you what God has said is going to happen. No, no, no. We're going to do it. It's just, it's just disobedience because they still don't believe God. And they're routed. Now, here are the truths for application. I mentioned Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3 looks at this story and says, Look, as I swore in my wrath to that, that generation, they shall not enter my rest. And he says in Hebrews 3.12, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. We've said it before, but here, here are the truths of application. We've said this multiple times. Number one, that the fruit of unbelief, the fruit of unbelief is disobedience, which leads to sorrow and, and ultimately death. And so when I, when I encounter disobedience in my life, I say, okay, what is it that I'm not believing God about? Maybe I'm, I'm not believing what God says about the possibility of obedience. Maybe I don't believe what God says about the reward of obedience. Maybe I don't believe God about just, just the factual statements that he's made about how I should live. When I encounter disobedience in my life, what is it that I'm not believing him about? And, and some of us are going to say, you know what? 
I haven't believed him about his son Jesus. I, I'm, not a, I'm not in Christ. I don't, I'm not a believer. I need to, to start there and place my faith in him. Others of us are going to say, you know what? The, the presence of this disobedience is not characteristic with who I am in Christ. I need to think through this very carefully and, and ask God for forgiveness to come back and say, okay, I'm, I'm believing in you. Help, help me deal with this. A second truth to think about here is this, that the fruit of belief is obedience, which leads to joy and ultimately eternal life. And what I would encourage us to think about here is, is a couple things. First of all, whenever th- this becomes most difficult to cling to, whenever everyone around us is disagreeing with what obedience looks like. And so I, I base obedience not upon what other people tell me is, is realistic or reasonable. I say, you know, what, what has God told me? And that's what I'm going to do. And then I, I would also encourage us to think about this, as we've seen in the story. What this means is, is that I, I continue to obey. I don't say, you know what, I, I tried obedience for five months and nothing's changed. And I haven't experienced the joy that I want to yet. And so I guess God was wrong on this. No, obedience means, okay, it's been five months. It's still hard. I still believe. It's been five years, it's been hard, I still believe. It's been 50 years, it's still hard, I still believe, I'm still gonna persevere. Not not because I trust myself, not because I'm reaching for the stars or beyond. It's because I believe God. And then the last truth for us to, to think about is this. The object of faith is Jesus Christ, not my works. Now, I say this because this is, this is so hard for us to get the nuance right. Sometimes we say, okay, I've, I see this disobedience. I'm, I'm being disobedient here. I, I'm, not, um, I'm not telling the truth like I need to all the time, and I'm kicking puppies, and I'm not eating my vegetables. So I, I, see, this, I see this disobedience here, and so I guess, I guess I'm, I'm not uh, believing God, so I'm going to stop kicking puppies and eat my vegetables and always tell the truth or whatever. And, and I start doing those things like, I must be a Christian. I'm, I must be right with God. No. When I see the disobedience, I don't say, well, I'm just going to fix the works and then I'm going to be okay. I say, no, there's something wrong with my heart. I'm not believing God about something. So God, help me believe you. Help me come to you and trust in you and rely on you. And then I need to see the obedience flow from that. My, my faith cannot be in my works. It has to be in Jesus Christ. Belief. Belief in God And here in the book of Numbers, obviously they don't understand everything about Jesus, but they do understand this reality that God is providing salvation. Belief in Jesus Christ produces obedience and leads to joy. And it's the only type of joy that will sustain us and be true and will be true for eternity. And it's the joy I pray for you and for me, for each of us. The joy that we find by believing in Jesus Christ, trusting in him alone, experiencing sustained obedience on the basis of that faith, which leads to joy. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for the eternal life we have through faith in him. We pray that you would help sustain us in our commitment uh, to, to trust in him. Help us to do that today, tomorrow, for every moment that you grant us by your grace not uh, just for our own glory, but for the glory of your great name that we desire to exalt, the purpose for which we were created. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.